called an approach to the etiology and like an approach to the history, an approach to the examination, and then a couple of the commonly encountered deep neck spaces and the infections that occur in them. So uh, I'll um, just run through some of the common etiologies, the approach, some basic management principles, um, surgical management options, and some and a few specific examples. So the deep neck spaces are classified anatomically into facial spaces, uh, the buccal, canine, masticator, and parotid space, uh, then suprahyoid and intrahyoid spaces, and spaces that tra uh, traverse the, ho the whole length of the neck from base of skull to mediastinum. And the most commonly encountered spaces are those indicated in the picture, but th th there really is a very long list. Uh, the etiology of deep neck space infections can broadly be sort of, it's quite overwhelming to try and think of all of the, the, the causes, but you can think of it as basically separative and non-separative infections. The separative infections obviously re resulting in a deep neck space abscess. And the, the infections can also be classified as uh, separative infections arising from uh, deep cervical lymphadenopathy uh, for, for all sorts of causes. Um, infections arising in congenital and acquired cysts in the neck, and I'll go through those as well. Um, spread from adjacent deep neck spaces. Uh, so those are the main ones. In pediatrics, the, by far the most common uh, etiology is, is an acute pharyngitis or adenoiditis. And in, in adults, dental infections are by far the most common cause. Um, important just to bear in mind is that in 20%, there's no cause found. The microbiology is usually polymicrobial, um, mixed anaerobes and aerobes. Uh, strep viridans group with strep anginosis specifically is by far the most common overall. But uh, one must also consider in specific locations, uh, for example, a deep neck space infection originating in the pharynx, uh, Fusobacterium necroforum is quite common and that can result in Lemire syndrome. Uh, deep neck spaces in, in infections arising in the middle ear is obviously most commonly staph and strep, uh, pseudomonas and sometimes anaerobes. And deep neck space infections arising in the sinuses are often from strep pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, Maroxella catarrhalis, staph aureus and anaerobes. And then lastly, in immune compromised or suppressed patients, they often get um, extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae. So if we go through uh, specifically the um, deep neck space infections in, um, uh, due, 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 due to cervical lymphadenopathy, um, uh, tuberculous scrofula is very common. Uh, that typically occurs in young adults, often immune compromised, uh, often have an associated pulmonary TB or TB contacts. So those are all things that, you, that one could ask for in the history. They tend to get multiple matted tender lymphadenopathy in levels two and five. The skin is often quite erythematous and there's often a discharging sinus. Uh, importantly in the treatment is if you think that it is possibly a tuberculous uh, lymphadenitis causing the deep neck space infection, uh, the, the important thing is to avoid an incisional biopsy because you wouldn't want to uh, end up in a, a, discharging, a permanently discharging sinus. So the treatment would be anti-tuberculous treatment. Um, HIV often gets uh, cervical lymphadenopathy uh, as uh, part of the early stage of, of the HIV disease. You get a persistent generalized lymphadenopathy that follows the one, two, three rule, which is that uh, lymph nodes are one centimeter or more in size, two or more extra inguinal sites, and typically last for more than three months. So that's the, the uh, diagnostic criteria for uh, persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. So again, if you if you think that it, it that the patient's deep neck space infection is from that, then the treatment ultimately may may just be ARVs. Infectious mononucleosis, um, called kissing disease, um, tends to occur in young adults, so teenagers and young adults. It's a severe acute tonsillitis and pharyngitis, but importantly, they would often have a hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, so you can look for that specifically on examination uh, and, that, and finding that would, would then be suggestive. 
Ah, um, okay. Historically, a monospot test was um, that was uh, used in the diagnosis, but that's um, found to be too insensitive to be practically used nowadays. And one uses uh, Epstein Barr virus antibody teasers. Uh, the important thing is that if you think that the lymphadenopathy and deep neck space infection is from infectious mononucleosis, uh, you should avoid immunostimulation with ampicillin and amoxicillin and avoid contact sports because of a risk of splenic rupture. Uh, Mactanomycosis and nocardiosis are uncommon infections. Um, Actinomycosis is a normal commensal actually in the oral cavity, uh, but the, the, the lymphadenitis tends to break down and produce multiple sinus tracts to the skin that looks clinically very similar to, to TB or malignancy. Uh, histology shows sulfur granules, so that's helpful in the diagnosis, and the treatment of actinomycosis and nocardiosis are quite specific. Uh, so one must bear that in mind if that's part of the differential diagnosis. Um, cat scratch disease can, um, can cause a cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, you don't only have to be scratched by a cat, it can just be exposure to cats. If you have a cat in your house uh, and, the, and the fleas that are on the cat can bite you, you can end up with cat scratch disease. Um, so uh, uh, so the, the treatment is specific there. Um, azithromycin is useful. Um, uh, then for people, I think only really studying for, for final exams, Kikuchi's disease, which I hadn't heard of previously, is an acute, uh, a subacute necrotizing lymphadenitis uh, described in young Asian women with non-tender uh, lymphadenopathy in level five. It's self-limiting, but was, was monitored for subsequent development of SLE up to three years later. So then if we look at all of the deep neck space infections arising as a result of infection in a congenital cervical cyst, uh, ones get, uh, they, they often have a, firstly have a history of a previous intermittent swellings in the same area. So one can ask for that on a history. Um, the different congenital cysts that can result in complication with deep neck space infections would be a branchial cleft cyst. Um, which is an embryologically trapped piece of ectoderm in the cervical sinus. There's a, a slight predilection for the left more than the right side, typically in the anterior, uh, anterior to the upper third of the uh, stenocleidomastoid muscle um, in young adults and often follows an upper respiratory tract infection. So one should ask those um, that, that on, on the history. Uh, thyroglossal duct cyst is either midline or paramedian and classically elevates with protrusion of the tongue. So uh, uh, a deep neck space infection with uh, the midline bulge, one should specifically look for that. Dermoid cysts are also embryologically trapped ectoderm and mesoderm. So there you, you often get hair follicles and sweat glands, etc. in the in the histology. They tend to occur along lines of embryological fusion of the facial processes. So they occur either in the midline or lateral to the submandibular gland. Uh, but they can also occur anywhere else, uh, secondary to implantation from surgical or traumatic wounds. Uh, then lastly, cystic hygroma. Um, it can be complicated by deep neck space infection. And a bronchial cyst is, is a cyst of the, of the airways, actually. It occurs slightly more commonly in boys than girls. It tends to uh, present with a, a mass in the suprasternal notch, uh, very rarely. Obviously, it's much more common in the, in the thoracic cavity, but it can occur in the thoracic notch. Um, and one third of them also have a, dis a permanently discharging sinus. Uh, then looking at deep neck space infections uh, that uh, occur as a complication of an acquired cervical cyst, um, it's only really laryngocils, um, so you can ask about um, whether they play a wind instrument, uh, saccular cysts in the larynx, and a plunging ranula. There is a bit of debate as to whether a plunging ranula is an acquired or a congenital cyst. Um, there seems to be some evidence that there's genetic factors that predispose you to developing a, a, a plunging ranula, um, but it's, it's not always present in, in early childhood. And all of them can be complicated by deep neck space infections.
So then lastly, if we look at um, deep neck space infections arising from spread from adjacent spaces, um, there's four commonly occurring scenarios that that slide is taken out of KJ Lee, uh, where you can see um, acute tonsillitis is often complicated by a peritonsillar abscess. The in infection can then spread to the parapharyngeal space and then either to retropharyngeal space and down carotid sheath or, to the, or anteriorly to the submandibular space and then to the visceral space. Another common scenario is in acute rhinosinusitis that can spread to retropharyngeal lymph nodes in adults and from there to the parapharyngeal space and also to the carotid space. Uh, scenario three is dental infections and Ludwig's angina, that kind of thing. If it involves the upper jaw, that can spread to the masticator space and te um, pterygium maxillary space and then intratemporal fossa and, um, and also the parapharyngeal space. And from the lower jaw, uh, the first molar t goes to the sublingual space and second and third molar goes to the submandibular space. Those two are obviously interchangeable, anterior and posteriorly. And from the submandibular space, you can also spread to the parapharyngeal space and visceral space. And then the last scenario is following any upper airway tract instrumentation, but classically from uh, esophagoscopies or intubation, um, that can cause a deep neck space infection that spreads to the parapharyngeal space and or, or the retropharyngeal space, and obviously from there to the mediastinum uh, and, and danger space as well. So clinically, um, if we look at just taking an approach to history, um, if you look at all those factors listed in, in, in all of the, the scenarios above, there's specific things that one should ask for in the history uh, of the, uh, the, that the patient has. So if you, if, regarding the history of the presenting complaint, um, have they had any previous intermittent swellings? That would suggest a congenital uh, uh, cyst. Um, have they had any recent dental e infections or extractions? Because then that's leading towards a Ludwig's angina as a possible cause. Um, recent uh, surgery or endoscopy, uh, recent ear infections. Um, if so, it could be a Bezold's abscess tracking down into the parapharyngeal space. Um, if there's a history of a recent upper respiratory tract infection, um, or a TB or HIV, that obviously is uh, points one in, in, in specific directions. Uh, then if they are immune compromised or suppressed, uh, they often tend to present with a rapidly progressive uh, spread of the infections from, from uh, sort of across the, the, the deep neck spaces. Um, social history, uh, one should ask for uh, if the patient has any exposure to cats. Uh, like we said, not only a scratch, just exposure to cats or farm animals. Uh, for the brucellosis, um, if they've been eating undercooked meat or dairy products um, for those atypical zoonotic infections, and if they play any wind instruments, um, which would be a risk for having a laryngocele, which may be the underlying cause. Um, then if we look at the an, an approach to the examination, um, just generally speaking, if the patient is uh, the patients with deep neck space infections generally are usually quite acutely unwell, febrile, toxically ill. Um, if they have stridor or dyspnea, that can either be from local pressure on the airway itself, or it can be from spread of the infection to, to cause a mediastinitis that can cause stridor and dyspnea. Uh, drooling would be suggestive of a peritonsillar abscess, retropharyngeal space abscess, or possibly Ludwig's angina. Trismus and hypothetical voice, also peritonsillar space abscess, um, parapharyngeal space, or masticator space. Uh, torticollis would just suggest inflammation of the uh, sternocleidomastoid, uh, secondary to the deep neck space infection. Then, if you get a combination of Horner's syndrome, hoarseness, and a unilateral weakness of the tongue, those that triad would be suggestive of carotid space involvement because of the structures in the carotid space. Um, then if you examine the neck and you find crepitus, that could be suggestive of a gas forming organism, which are um, managed a little bit differently. Uh, that's one of the contraindications to conservative treatment. So that's important to, to examine. 
Um, a discharging sinus is not only TB, it can also be, like we said, actinomycosis or no cardiosis. And it can obviously also be malignancies, but that's off the topic of the presentation. Uh, one should always look in the ears, see if there's an acute otitis media or acute mastoiditis. Um, those are kind of things that if you don't specifically look for, you wouldn't maybe know that there's perhaps a Bezold's abscess tracking down into the parapharyngeal space. Uh, if it weren't for the COVID era, you could uh, do a, a nasal endoscopy and look for rhinosinusitis or adenoiditis in children um, as, a, as a potential cause for a retropharyngeal space infection. Um, in, the, in the oral cavity and throat, uh, you should look for a unilateral asymmetrical oropharyngeal swelling or a deviation of the uvula. That would obviously be highly suggestive of a peritonsillar abscess or possibly a parapharyngeal space infection or abscess. One should look for dental infections, loose teeth, uh, gingivitis, um, poor dental hygiene could, could contribute to a submandibular abscess or Ludwig's andrina. Uh, floor of mouth swelling, if it's particularly edematous and discolored, could be from Ludwig's andrina. Uh, you should look at the um, salivary papillae of Wharton and, and Stenson's ducts. Uh, if there's purulence uh, siluria coming from the ducts, that could be a, a silabnitis that can cause a, a subnibular uh, space infection. And then biomanual palpation for silabithiasis. Um, if the patient is clinically stable um, and if the COVID uh, pandemic is resolved, then one could do a flexible nasal endoscopy. And it's obviously important to um, assess any airway obstruction before sending the patient, for example, to a CT scan. You wouldn't want to send them to a CT scan where there may be a long uh, uh, a waiting time without having it at least assessed the airway first. Uh, so that's an approach to the examination. Then uh, just a quick differential diagnosis for a neck abscess in an adult more than 35 years old. One should bear in mind that it's not necessarily infective and it would be important to exclude cystic nodal metastases. So they obviously by far um, most commonly come from oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, particularly in the area of Waldeyer's ring, so uh, pharyngeal and lingual tonsils most commonly, and obviously especially if it's a HPV-related oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Other less common sites are nasopharyngeal carcinoma, um, which obviously still is in keeping with the Waldeyer's ring, so the, the top two are from Waldeyer's ring, uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma does sometimes have cystic nodal metastases. And then uh, major salivary glands and sites in which you can find minor salivary glands. So specifically larynx, hard palate, sinuses, and esophagus. There's one of the theories of um, producing cystic nodal metastases is that it's, it, it, it may be um, breakdown of the, of the tumor, but it may also... Uh, possibly be a true cyst formed by secretion of saliva, so either from the major or minor salivary glands uh, with the sites listed below. Um, lastly, um, branchial carcinoma is italicized because um, there's some schools of thought that believe that it's either exceptionally rare or possibly um, not a true entity. It was previously described that Branchial cleft cysts could develop a, a, a could be complicated by a carcinoma, um, but those cases are now thought to actually probably have been the um, uh, cystic nodal metastases from um, sites that, that from primaries that weren't um, appreciated. So, if we look at the investigations of a deep neck space infection, one should aspirate it, um, obviously for uh, for an MCS and Zeal Nielsen, gene expert to test for TB. If you suspect clinically that it could be an actinomycosis or no cardiosis, those are things that, that one should specifically request on the request form um, because there's specific stains that need to be used to identify those uh, uh, pathogens. Um, one should do an FNA to exclude malignancy, particularly in adults over the age of 35. Um, inflammatory markers would be useful for um, for uh, seeing if it's in keeping with a with a sort of infectious process, but also um, 
so specifically a leukocytosis, but also a leukopenia would be suggestive of either HIV or a possible hematological malignancy, which could then be investigated further. The UNE would be required for contrast injection of a, of a contrasted CT. Uh, plain x-rays are obviously quick um, to do, um, cheap, widely available all throughout um, uh, most African countries. So specifically a panorex would show lucencies of the dental root and can also show silolithiasis. Um, a, a, and, and then lateral C-spine X-ray can show prevertebral air or prevertebral soft tissue swelling that would be measured at the just anterior to the C2 vertebra and um, swellings of more than five millimeters in a child or seven millimeters in an adult. And um, there are many different ways, uh, alternative ways of defining how much swelling is a soft tissue swelling. Uh, but those would be suggestive of a possible retropharyngeal abscess. Uh, one can see a thumb sign in a lateral C-spine x-ray, which be, would be suggestive of an epiglottitis or superglottitis, and one may see air fluid levels. Um, a chest x-ray is useful, particularly if the patient is dyspneic or coughing, and one can see a widened mediastinum suggestive of mediastinitis, and possibly a, a right lower lobe infiltration suggestive of, of um, aspiration. An ultrasound can be useful in some deep neck space infections. Um, obviously, it is operator dependent, um, and that does limit the sensitivity, but um, it, 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 it does have some utility in some uh, spaces. Obviously, a contrasted CT neck is, is, um, is probably the most useful investiga uh, imaging investigation. Um, and one would include a, a CT of the chest as well if there's signs or symptoms of mediastinitis, um, if the patient is stable. Um, so a CT can distinguish between an abscess or just a, 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 a phlegmon. Um, it can distinguish between an abscess that's localized within lymph nodes or if it's not contained and is spreading throughout different deep neck spaces can, and can also obviously identify which spaces specifically are involved. And then lastly, if there's an underlying malignancy, a CT can identify some characteristic features of metastatic lymph nodes as well. Uh, when it comes to staging of deep neck space infections, um, there is a staging system in Scott Brown's seventh edition that unfortunately doesn't have a reference, but the, the, it describes five stages uh, where stage one, two, and three are unilateral, and either intrahyoid, suprahyoid, or traversing the whole length of the neck. Stage four and five are bilateral, uh, with four being suprahyoid and five being uh, across the whole length of the neck. And obviously, a, a proportionately increasing um, a risk or incidence of surgical complications in those patients. Um, so, if we look at management, general sort of management principles of deep neck space infections, um, obviously uh, one should um, assess the airway, and if there's an upper airway obstruction, then adrenaline nebulizers would be one of the first line um, uh, modes of treatment. Um, IV glucocorticoids are controversial, um, and some of the um, Evidence-based medicine says that one cannot recommend the routine use of IV glucocorticoids, but obviously on a case-by-case -case basis where the, where the benefit outweighs the risk, obviously it is widely used. Um, obviously, a, an emergency tracheostomy may be required if there's worsening uh, stridor or respiratory distress. Um, there's different ways of doing a, a, this emergency tracheostomy. So firstly, if the patient is awake, um, and, and has an adequate um, airway, um, which you've assessed on a flexible nasal endoscopy um, post-COVID pandemic, when then the, the, the tracheostomy uh, route of choice would be an awake nasal intubation, railroading the ET tube over the endoscope. If the airway is too obstructed to be able to do that, or if there's a, a prediction by the anesthetist of a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, then obviously an awake tracheostomy would have to be done. And then lastly, just um, in the context of Ludwig's angina, one should often 
consider doing a, a semi-urgent tracheostomy um, just in anticipation of imminent, uh, severe, and prolonged airway edema, so b before the patient uh, is in extremis. In terms of fluid management, um, patients are often dehydrated because of poor oral intake from uh, peritonsal abscesses, retropharyngeal abscesses, etc. So um, a, a patient may need to be fluid resuscitated. But then on the other side of the spectrum as well, dehydration may actually be the cause of sialidinitis and sialolithiasis. So that may be contributing to the underlying cause. Um, uh, empiric antibiotics should be started as soon as possible uh, with broad spectrum antibiotics and typically IV augmentin plus or minus metronidazole um, if, it's a, if it's an oral cavity, a severe oral cavity um, infection. Um, I was, uh, so then there is some role for conservative management in some deep neck space infections. So conservative management would be defined as at least doing an incision and drainage under local anesthetic to get an MCS to have um, di uh, directed antibiotics um, eventually. But um, what, so one would do the incision and drainage, start with empiric antibiotics as soon as possible, keep the patient nil per os, and resuscitate with IV fluids. So that the requirements for, for doing conservative management would be obviously if there's no airway compromise. The abscess should be less than two centimeters in diameter, and it should be contained within one lymph node or a phlegmon or in a, sing, a single deep neck space um, uh, uh, demonstrated um, on, on clinically or on imaging and there should be no crepitus or no air fluid level. Those would be suggestive of a gas forming organism, which is a contraindication to conservative treatment. Uh, chest x-rays should obviously be done and show a normal mediastinum. You wouldn't want to be treating a, a mediastinitis conservatively. And ultrasound, if it is available after the aspiration of, of, the, of the, if it's an abscess, um, if an ultrasound is available, then uh, showing complete aspiration is obviously supportive of continuing with conservative management. And then availability of serial imaging is quite an important uh, requirement. You wouldn't want to be, uh, well, let's say, if, if serial imaging was not going to be available, that, that might push one towards a slightly more a proactive approach as opposed to a conservative approach. And then obviously a good response to initial empiric antibiotic treatment would, would obviously be required. So the, the, the opposites of those would be the indications for um, surgical exploration. So airway compromise, a large abscess, multiple deep neck spaces, uh, gas forming organism, mediastinitis, an ultrasound that, that's done that shows incomplete aspiration, no imaging or limited imaging available or poor response to initial antibiotics. And the sort of 24 to 48 hours is the the approximate line in the sand of, of how long you would persist with conservative treatment. So the goals of surgical exploration would be uh, firstly, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds intuitive, but if you actually think about it, first, the, the first goal must be to sample the, the inflammatory fluid or pus to, to get an MCS for directed antibiotic treatment. Secondly, would be to address the underlying cause. So if it's a dental extraction, uh, sorry, if, it, if it's a dental infection, then the, the infected teeth must be uh, extracted. If there's a foreign body, that should be removed, etc. cetera. Um, after addressing the underlying cause, and uh, one should obviously irrigate the, 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 um, the involved deep neck spaces copiously, um, avoid unnecessary dissection, because you wouldn't want to um, risk the normal adjacent structures that are obviously already quite inflamed and friable. So you want to be careful with your dissection. But then also um, um, unnecessary dissection may provide a false tract. And, uh, and a false tract could then um, cause like an iatrogenic potential roots of further spread of the infection. Uh, one would obviously leave a corrugated or Penrose drain to, to create a, an external drainage pathway that'll prevent further recurrence and a loose closure of the skin. So 
Now, if we just look at some commonly occurring infections and how they differ slightly from, from the, the general, um, like we said in the beginning, a dental infection is by far the most common cause of deep neck space infections in adults. Um, from the upper jaw, they tend to spread to the masticator space. And from the lower jaw, we've said from the first or second and third molar, they've got different uh, pathways of spread. Um, but uh, particularly from the second and third molar can end up in the parapharyngeal space and danger space resulting in mediastinitis. Uh, Ludwig's angina is a classical um, uh, uh, sort of historical diagnosis that's um, not as common nowadays as, as it used to be in the era before antibiotics. Described by Dr. Ludwig, an angina has, nothing, has no reference to the cardiac angina, but rather just that it's a, a, a tight feeling um, and a, a, a sort of constricting sort of feeling, and that's exactly what they get. So it's a cellulitis of submental, sublingual, and submandibular spaces, and they've got a particularly high mortality, around 40% in, in some cases from asphyxia due to the swelling and posterior displacement of the base of tongue. Um, there's another nice uh, sort of map from also from KJ Lee showing the different uh, pathways of spread of upper and lower dental abscesses going uh, super early into the canine space and infratemporal fossa, potentially into the orbit, which can appear similar to a complicated sinusitis, um, and inferiorly into the submandibular and masticator spaces. Um, and lateral pharyngeal space then into the carotid sheath and mediastinum and uh, intracranial as well. Um, so that's what um, patients sometimes look like with the degree of swelling of the, of the tongue that the patient on the left has obviously had his tracheostomy already, uh, but you can see the, the extent of the soft tissue swelling uh, in the airway and how quickly that can spread to to a, to a major airway, upper airway obstruction. So uh, the penultimate one is a peritonsillar abscess, probably by far one of the most commonly encountered um, abscesses in ENT. And uh, so the, the, the space is uh, just lateral to the tonsils. Um, and so that describes where one would, where one would uh, make the incision and drainage or, or, or a needle aspiration to, to drain the abscess. Um, just looking quickly at the evidence-based medicine around peritonsillar abscesses, there's a study uh, by Prof. Luke in 2013 that shows that an ultrasound can distinguish a peritonsillar abscess from peritonsillar cellulitis. Um, IV corticosteroids are known are, are shown to improve pain control that's by Osbeck in 2004 um, there was uh, some uh, th there was a, a review uh, looking at whether routine screening should be done for infectious mononucleosis I didn't include that reference there but anyway um, the, the conclusion was that EBV antibodies should be tested only in teens or adults if they have a generalized lymphadenopathy as opposed to just a cervical lymphadenopathy, and if they have a splenomegaly, then EBV um, antibody testing is warranted. They also said that if you suspect infectious mononucleosis as being the underlying cause, irrespective of the serology, one should add liver function tests and advise the patient to, uh, to avoid contact sports because of the risk of, of splenic rupture. Um, there's a debate with needle aspiration versus incision and drainage. And there's a review by Johnson in 2003 that shows incision and drainage to be slightly more effective, but the number needed to treat is almost 50. So it's very slight advantage of incision and drainage. Cochrane Review also has a, a review showing that incision and drainage does result in less recurrence um, in, ag in agreement with Johnson but that needle aspiration is also less painful. But the Cochrane Review does also point out that the level of evidence for, for those conclusions is very, very weak. Then uh, lastly, there's a, um, there was some uh, debate as to whether a Quincy tonsillectomy or a hot tonsillectomy 
is of use. And there's a, 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 a randomized controlled trial by Prof. Fagan in 1994 showing that a quincy tonsillectomy does result in almost immediate and definitely much quicker pain relief, um, definitely fewer days off work, and less wasted theatre time because you're not uh, having the potential of patients defaulting their appointment for interval tonsillectomy um, weeks later. So uh, parapharyngeal space, lastly, um, is, um, is, is, a, is, a in, is a shape of an inverted pyramid running from the base of skull to the hyoid bone. Um, and sorry, I've lost my notes there. But uh, so that it, they, they do um, tend to get infections that can either be in the pre-styloid space, like you see in the picture there, with a large bulging mass in the oropharynx bulging immediately into the into the oral, into the oropharynx um, if it involves the post styloid space then they would tend to get complications from involvement of the carotid sheath so that's the triad of Horner's syndrome um, unilateral tongue weakness and a horse voice um, the etiology is is uh, most commonly odontogenic and it can sometimes arise, like we said, from any instrumentation, but particularly um, upper airway endoscopies or intubation, or as a result of spread from peritonsillar abscess, parotitis, or abyssal's abscess. Uh, there we are, that's what we said, that uh, a pre-styloid space clinically would cause trismus as well, induration below the angle of the mandible, and that classical medial bulge into the oropharyngeal space. Post-styloid, like we said, Horner's syndrome, hoarseness, and a unilateral tongue weakness, which is obviously from involvement of the carotid sheath. The complications are obviously upper airway obstruction if that, if that oropharyngeal swelling increases, bacteremia through seeding through the carotid sheath. Um, if the carotid artery becomes, um, if the wall is weakened, by the, inf by the in infectious and inflammatory process that can cause a mycotic aneurysm and um, internal jugular vein thrombophlebitis is Lemire's syndrome. And it can also spread to the retropharyngeal space and from there to the danger space and, and cause mediastinitis. Um, like, so that, that the, the guidelines for conservative treatment may potentially be applied to parapharyngeal space infections if the abscess is less than two centimeters, if there's no crepitus, no air fluid level, and a good response to initial IV antibiotics. Um, if, if, there's, if there's any of those that are not the case, then one would uh, go for a surgical treatment, which can either be transoral or transcervical. And just to note that with the transoral treatment, what it may require first doing a tonsillectomy just to get into the parapharyngeal space. And if you're doing a trans cervical approach, one should um, be careful to avoid injury to the marginal mandibular branch of facial nerve. There are many, many, many um, deep neck space infections and abscesses and different surgical approaches that I haven't even tried to address. But that's hopefully just a, a bit of an overview and, a, and an approach to the history and examination and commons that commonly encountered in sections. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions? Well, Simon, can I make a few comments? Are you there? Can you hear? Okay, just to say, uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for a very good overview. Um, uh, just a few comments. Um, firstly, just, just on, uh, on the issue of... Can you hear? Yeah, um, on account of mycosis, just to caution that it can be difficult to make a diagnosis. Um, so, um, so you might end up even even taking a soft tissue biopsy. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, that you mentioned you mentioned the issue about intubation versus tracheostomy. Um, is that better? Okay, you mentioned the issue of, of, of intubation versus tracheostomy. Uh, one of the cases where you have to have a low, th low threshold for doing a tracheostomy is with, uh, with Ludwig's angina. 
because remember to 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 intubate the patient uh, the anesthetist has to be has to be able to elevate the tongue anteriorly and if you have sepsis in the floor of the mouth you know then that might preclude it so you should really have a low threshold for doing a a tracheostomy rather than intubation for for Ludwig's angina and um, and also just to say that with the Quincy if you are having to intubate someone with a Quincy that um, that generally you find that the moment the patient has been has been been anesthetized that the, that the trismus that they might present with actually resolves but the trismus you know is mainly due to spasm of the uh, of the medial pterygoid so so quincy is slightly different to the other abscesses in the, in, in the neck uh, you mentioned the issue about about the indications for conservative management of of, of, um, of an abscess um, and having a cutoff of two centimeters I think the, the, the exception there would be, be infections of, of a branchial cyst or of a thyroid glossal duct cyst, because those are, are a single cavity and those most certainly you can aspirate. You don't have to incise and drain them. Um, just, a, just a comment in terms of, of neck incisions. If you're going to be, 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 be draining a parotid abscess, I mean, use a parotid incision and you might, might elevate a flap. And if you're going to be draining neck abscesses, make transverse incisions in skin creases rather than vertical incisions. And the last comment is about, you referred a few times to, to infections which have been caused by sepsis of the first and second and third molar teeth. And you didn't quite, uh, quite explain why, why, why infection of the first molar should involve the sub sublingual space as opposed to the second and third molars going to the neck and the reason there there is the is the attachment of the Mahler high road uh, along the Mahler high road line it, you know that angles upwards posteriorly so the roots of the second and third molar are generally below the, the level of the Mahler high road line and that's why they tend to go to the neck yeah perhaps we can ask Shadia just to comment from a pediatric perspective um i uh, i don't have much to say maybe just to caution about the size of the abscess you know two centimeters in a really small child may have uh, a different clinical presentation than in an adult i also think aspiration may be a little bit more of a a, a better choice in, in younger children um, and also especially with the branchials and the thyroglossals because sometimes cutting into it can create um, spread and it may be difficult when the surgeon returns to get good clearance uh, following that. So the first incision would probably be uh, really important and in some setting maybe better done by an ENT than a pediatric surgeon in children. Um, some, we sometimes don't get to it early, but it's better to refer in that sense. Um, I think also in, in what Prof you're saying about the floor of mouth swelling and you also need to know what your um, unit is capable of performing. In some centers, they have flexible nasal endoscopy and they would intubate in that uh, technique with your um, pediatric pulmonologist or even with, uh, with the anesthetist. But if you don't have that setting, you know, then you, you, you're kind of stuck with a trachea postoperatively uh, in, in those uh, cases as well, if there's a significant floor of mouth swelling. Thanks. I could ask, ask Kenneth um, fr from Ghana to comment, perhaps. He's a very experienced head and neck surgeon. Yes, thank you, Prof. Um, um, it was a nice presentation, quite a well uh, researched um, overview. Um, from our end here, um, we, we pass on the Ludwig anginas to the maxillofacia, so we don't tend to handle them a lot. But then, because we share a ward with them, they almost every day have somebody with Ludwig angina on the ward. Um, airway management, that we take care of them for them. But then, um, most of the time, we don't get to do trackies on them, but once in a long while, we get to do them. Um, from our cohort of Then 
complications of um, as peritonsal abscesses have been significant, um, extending to the parapharyngeal space. But overall, and then rarely we get the congenital ones where they present with insidious, that may be um, branchial um, sinuses which get infected and then suppurate or otherwise cause a, a, a deep neck abscess. So in a summary, that's about the scope we tend to handle here, but it's mainly inflammatory from, from, from infections. But the, 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 in the adult side, it's mainly the, the complications of bone impactation. Thank That's you. Uh, right, any comments from, uh, from Anna, also from, from, from Ghana? Is Anna still on the call? Anna Connie? Right. Any other comments from or, or questions from anyone um, on the um, on the conference call? But Nick, I'll hold, uh, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Prof. Um, if there are no uh, further questions, uh, then we're going to close the meeting. Um, our next meeting will be this Friday um, at. Uh, nine o'clock. Uh, wait, we have a question uh, from Madi. Oh, okay, Madi, do you want to go uh, through with your question? We've got five minutes. No, um, we've got another question. Can, can you get the Ludwig? Uh, uh, the question is uh, from Madi. Uh, can you get a Ludwig's angina uh, from a Quincy? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, do you want to comment on that? I, I've never heard of that. But I've never seen that. Uh, if you're going to get a complicated um, abscess coming from a, a Quincy, that's going to extend, as Simon said, more, more posteriorly and inferior to the, to the parapharyngeal space. Because, of course, the parapharyngeal space abuts the, the, the constrictor muscle, which is just on the other side of the, of the, of the actual um, Quincy abscess. Um, so, most certainly, I've never seen it tracking forwards. Okay. Um, Kenneth, have you ever seen that happening? No, I've not seen a Quincy from a par um, I've not seen a Ludwig's from a Quincy. Most of them are related to the dentition. So um, Ludwig's and is primarily a dental complication of a dental um, unattended dental infection. So, and, and Quincy, like we, we, we know, is from the tonsils, and Prof has told us where they, they, they spread to. So, I don't think it's likely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we've got one, another question from Zanele. Oh, hello. Hello. Can you hear? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. I'm with Zanele here. Um, so we we we, uh, we are from uh, Walter uh, Sule in Amtata. We just just wanted to ask: Is it um, is it how, how, if you have like a retropharyngeal um, collection uh, from TB, which 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 is the surgical. best approach? Like surgically, is it an option to do like a transoral, or it's better to do like an external drainage in those patients? But perhaps we can ask Shalde to comment because you see that in pediatrics. Pediatrics. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. Um, <laughs> in children, it's uh, you know it's a tricky one because they generally present with airway obstruction, especially if it's a big uh, a big collection. We generally like to do it uh, trans orally. So you would put the patient into uh, the you know the tonsil uh, tonsillectomy position with your BD gag. Make sure the patient obviously has an oral ray, and um, you would uh, do an incision and drainage in that route. If obviously it's um, extending down into your danger uh, zone and further distally, then you want to obviously have proper imaging, and you may have to do a combined procedure. A lot of the time in children, if you've done the oral approach, you've pretty much drained uh, a lot of the contents, 
and even if there is a residual neck component, it's, uh, it's decompressed by then. You know, with TB, if you suspect that, especially you don't want to have a draining sinus in the neck, you want to avoid that, especially if it is a cold abscess. And so you won in both regards in the sense that you don't have a skin incision by going transorally, and obviously you're draining into a, a cavity that uh, will seal after it's uh, decompressed. You would have to get imaging because it can be multi-loculated, and you want to make sure that the patient goes to ICU or a high care setting afterwards because there can be some um, uh, loss of the airway, especially if you've... Uh, intubated the patient and they may have sprayed the cords and you may have difficulty swallowing and feeding subsequent to that. So a nasogastric tube is also important. Um, and Shazia, would you a routinely biopsy the, the wall of the abscess to get the diagnosis in terms of, you know, the aspiration of the, compared to aspiration of the fluid alone? or drainage of the fluid alone? So I trained initially as a general surgeon and we always did that because you have coarsey bacillary contents in all the cold, sign, uh, cold abscesses. So you take as much of the fluid as you can and then you, you, if it's possible, obviously you don't want to go laterally where there are great vessels and stuff, but you do want to get a little piece of that capsule if you can, especially if uh, you know, it's in theatre under GA and you can see quite well, I would definitely do that. I also tend to find that I aspirate first a little bit just so I know that um, I'm going in at the, uh, at the peak of the abscess. And uh, the other thing to do, which we tend to also do, is put in a, a rigid telescope uh, while we have the patient in, in that suspended position. So you can look a little bit further down. Sometimes the extent can be visualized even beyond the, uh, the, the post-cricoid area, and you can milk it proximally uh, in that fashion. So yes, I send the word. Sorry, that's what you asked me. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's another question from Eric. Um, uh, in the setting of mediastinitis after parapharyngeal abscess, what uh, would uh, the treatment options be? Well, perhaps I can just comment there uh, um, yeah, that we've got the luxury of involving the cardiothoracic surgeons if that happens. But generally what it involves is first you want to image properly so you know where it is. You want to exclude an empyema um, 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 in the lung as well and um, um, because you might have to put in chest drains to drain that. Uh, and then generally one can drain, drain the mediastinitis from above. You know, so you might have to make an incision uh, um, just above the clavicle and then put a finger down there. And, uh, you know, and a finger is unlikely to uh, they penetrate any, any important structures. It's the safest um, um, sort of instrument in the neck, uh, neck and sepsis, sepsis situation. Um, so, um, so that's essentially what I would say about that. Thanks, Prof. Um, no more questions. Uh, so we're going to close uh, the meeting. Our, our next meeting will be this Friday at uh, 9 o'clock. We will have um, case presentations, um, I think, from one... Uh, from UCT Registrar and the Josh, uh, I think Josh West uh, from uh, Freer Hospital will also be present. Um, so we'll start that at uh, nine o'clock this Friday. Uh, thanks, see you guys then. Thank you.